Welcome back. Today we're going to try to transition away from some of the logic we've been doing and closer to the programs. And in fact, we're going to get there through a process that eventually builds the same things that mathematicians care about, things like sets and relations. And what we're going to do is take a path through types. And one of the things that types can do is link all of these topics together. And in a future lecture, we'll even add something else called categories, which is a very good diagrammatic tool to draw all these concepts together. Now, I'm going to stick with a simple introduction, so I'm going to stick with one of our easier logical operators, the AND, and we'll create a piece of a program to match it. But this is a hint of a general strategy. So let's get started. When you want to get paid, what you have to do is take your logic and turn it into something of substance. This might be other data that someone else wants to consume, or it might be actually printing a file onto sheets of paper so someone can have it, or manufacturing a good. I won't worry about what a substance is, but I want to think conceptually of what's going on. I'll have some logical task P. It's a conceptual idea of what it is I want. To make it into a commodity, I need to think of stuff, stuff of some type. The type T is playing the role of the concept that I'm trying to enable with my substance. Let's try to make this a little more realistic. Suppose that I asked myself a very mathematical concept. I was told the P was simply the following statement. If 541 equals 12 times Q plus R, then Q is 45 and R is equal to one. That's the kind of statement you might make about natural numbers. Since there are no negatives, there's really only one way to solve it. It's called the division algorithm. And as the name might suggest, there's actually a program behind it. To get something of substance, we would want the things that came at the end of the if then. Given 541 and the number 12, we could ask to compute the result 541 divided by 12 as an integer and 541 mod 12, what's the remainder? These are so common to arithmetic and to calculations that we might fail to see that there was an underlying logical sentence behind it before we even started writing a program. Now let's see something a little bit closer to our other example. What if we had that a printer was trying to be designed? The key process that we want for printing is that as long as there's paper and there's a job to be done in the queue, the printer should be printing. We don't want printers sitting idle, falling behind on the job. That's the goal, the specifications of the program, then we can write a program to match it. And it might look something like this. While has paper and the queue size is greater than zero, keep printing the next one in the queue. It's not quite if then, but it's somehow if then with a permanence in time. And that's the translation we make in the program. We're going to try to take our logic, turn them into data, and then turn them into programs. We're going to do a three-step process. We reason about the flow. This you'll see as flow charts in many early programming languages. Then we're going to annotate the data. We're going to tell each other what the pieces are. And then we're going to match them to programming idioms. That means the style of programming languages. And we'll have some examples to see. We're going to start with our reasoning, the logic. And I'm going to pick our simplest operator, the AND. So in AND, we need some context. Otherwise, we don't get started. And we have some events, A and B, which we claim are valid in this context. And what we use AND for is to create a single valid version of that context. So here's what that might look like in symbols. In the sequent calculus, we would say that we have gamma entails A and gamma entails B. The result is that gamma entails A and B. The simplification then, if we have A and B, we want to get out A or B. And those are the two elimination rules. We extract the constituent A from A and B or the constituent B. Again, this is all subject to it being true. How do we get paid? We turn these concepts into data. So the first thing we'll have to do is come up with a place to put the data. We're going to have two types of data here. We're going to have A and B. We're just going to describe them as some generic thing called a type, a data type, for example. And we're going to create a new type called A comma B. In logic, what we're trying to do is mirror that A comma B entails A and B. Only now we're adding to our data. See this A colon? That there is telling us that I now have a piece of data which is labeled as type A and another piece of data which is labeled as type B. We'll see examples explicitly in a minute. For instance, that A means that there's a string and B means there's an integer. So here I want a pair, an integer and a string pair. And I label them with this new type that I just formed up here. And this is a brand new thing. We don't have this in logic. Logic had introduction eliminations, but programs and types are going to have formation, the way to make types. Now we go back to our introduction rules. In logic, we had to introduce by entailment. Here, we simply do the same thing. We use our sequent calculus, but we now add the data in as well. No longer is just A and B giving us A and B. 
we have data of type A and data of type B. So what this means is we have a specific string and a specific integer giving us a string integer pair. That's the type of introduction that we've needed for this data. Once we have that, we move on to the elimination rules in logic. Elimination is how we get rid of the symbols in logic. If we had an and, we'd get rid of it. Now we have data, so we need to think about that. If we have a comma b of type a comma b with capitals, we want to return just a. And the same thing with this one. We can write that with two new types of terms. This is a form of encapsulation. We are taking a and b, which were separate, and we're gluing them together into one capsule called a comma b. You can't misuse the data if you've put it inside of a bundle that says use these as a pair. So if I want to get back the pieces, I'll need to call commands that strip out the other pieces I don't care about and extract just the pieces I want. So from x, I'd like to get a piece of data that has type a. From x, I'd like to get a piece of data that has type b. These are two separate commands. Now, you don't often find them as pi in a program. In a program, they'll have words like get a and get b, much better names at least if you're an English speaker. So we need to tell our computer how to relate the introduction, the way we made the data, to the elimination, the way we use the data. And that calls for a new rule, not inside the logic, which is the computation rule. And we'll keep track of this list with an F, an I, an E, and a C. I call these the FICE rule. It's similar to the lie rule. These initials are just an acronym to remember the components. If I give you an A and a B, then projecting to A should just give me back the A part. If I give you an A and a B, I could use that to manufacture A comma B. And if I asked you to evaluate this one on A comma B, I would get B. Okay, so here's the structure. We took two logical things we already knew how to do, introductions and eliminations, and we split them into two new pieces. The introductions added a formation, which was to take the type of data and glue it together in some way to form a new data type. That's how we build up data types. The elimination rule took the rules of how to get data out and split them up, adding a computation rule, which relates how the introduction and eliminations should relate to each other inside the computer. It's like a miniature program. Ah. While it's nice and convenient to think about these things in the miniature, there's always a context rolling around. And in programs, it's essential that we have the context because this is where we get a lot of the information. Sometimes in programming languages, we speak of things like side effects. Side effects are usually information that's given to you in the context that you can assume in certain situations and use it to your benefit. It can be confusing if you haven't told people in your context that they're there. So in programming languages specifically, we like to make that front and center. What we can see now is a side-by-side -side parallel of the logic and the program. On the logic side, we have two simplified tools. We just have the introduction rule in green and the elimination rules, which are two in this case, in blue. Those transfer into different parts of the program. The program has to add a formation rule. And the reason is because now our data is involving more than just one type of thing. It's got the type and the actual piece of data. And so there's two things that have to be created. One is a new type to represent this conjunction. The place will store and encapsulate our data. And one way to create the actual pieces of encapsulated data. If a was a string, then we would have a string a, and if b was an integer, we'd have an integer b. We'd store a string and an integer of type string, comma, integer. And because there are two parts of the introduction rule, their elimination rules also split up. We see that the elimination rule has the rule for just what type it is. We see that if we have data of type a, comma, b, it needs to be able to output something of type a. And how does it do it? We go to the computation rule. We see that if we had built everything from a little a and a little b, creating this a comma b, then this pi of a should just give us back the a. This is a straightforward little program, but as we evolve more and more, we'll have more interesting programs to plug in. Why do we need to think about pi of x? Why didn't we just put a comma b in at the start? And the reason is this is an effort to encapsulate the data. What we're trying to say is that while there were two parts, little a and little b, they've come together to make one unique, simple type of data called a comma b. Now that they're one type of data, we have no right to look inside. It's as if it's a brick now. So this part here is our individual x, and we don't see inside unless we have commands to access it. This is a discipline that prevents us from using things in non-logical ways, in ways that would somehow borrow information that we're not accessing at this particular logical step. 
The only way to get inside is to use one of our logical eliminators, like this one here. And that one matches up with this command, pi a of x. So x is not able to see inside to see the parts little a and little b. And you might feel like this is strange at the beginning, but what it does is it actually empowers us as programmers to design the way we want. Perhaps A and B are stored somewhere else and they're recomputed when needed. Or perhaps they're not even evaluated until we see that someone actually wants an A and then we'll pass it along. There's lots of tricks that can happen once we separate these concerns of the type of data we want and the way we bother to compute it. So let's finally turn this into some actual code. We'll take our formation rule, A comma B, and we'll turn that into a piece of Java code just for illustration. This means an import. As we've seen before, contexts are usually in programming languages in two forms. The implicit kind are things like the programming language, the operating system, the runtime, the type of microprocessor we're using. We don't change those, but they are part of the assumptions. The ones that are explicit contexts, we bother to list usually at the top of our program as part of the header. So what do we need to add? The rest of the formation rule is about combining two given types of data, A and B, and producing an A comma B. Now, programming languages prefer that we not use A comma B in this silly way. They want us to name our data types. So we'll simply use pair for the name, and we combine them with A comma B. Class is just a keyword for formation. It's just Java's way of telling us that we're at the formation step of our data type. We had to split up our introduction rule into a formation and a constructor, so here's our introduction rules. Our introduction rule needs to take little a of type big A and little b of type big B. Where are those coming from? Who knows? Context is going to give us that data eventually. All we need to do is prepare that when it does give us that data, we can build an example that encapsulates those little a's and little b's. And in our code in Java, it might look like this. In Java, instead of the colons a colon a, we like to put a space. Capital A still shows up and little a is the part there. The parameter a here is the same one that appears here when we formed the data type. These are also called generics depending on the programming language. Now what we're doing is we're building up a new example of where to put little a's and little b's. We want one example, one instance of it. A hint to know whether you're looking at an introduction is to notice that this kind of a function doesn't return anything. It's not computing and modifying. It's simply passing the data inside somewhere so it can be stored. That's not always the case, but it's a pretty good telltale sign. A function that has no return type, not even void, is probably a constructor. They also tend to have names like make or new. When you call such a function, you have to give it a special command. Because it's not returning any new values, it's just creating the encapsulated version. So often you'll have a command like new, meaning call this special thing, which is not a function because it doesn't return anything. What it returns is the newly minted data. Now what comes up? Elimination rules. Our eliminations take an encapsulated piece of data like x and just extract the pieces. This is the metaphor of having a and b and reducing it to a. Now, we know what that should do. We should just return little a for the a comma b, but we need to write this down as a piece of Java code. This could look like this. In Java, the return types of functions are listed before the program function name. So we see that we have a and then get a. This is the return type here, this a. And there's also a return type b. I've also changed the name to more conventional names for a programming language. I could have said pi a, but pi a is kind of a strange name for a program. It's better to call it get a, and it starts to sound like what it's going to do. Now, I still don't know how to program it because I haven't moved on to the last step. The last step is to produce a computational rule. Now, how would you spot an elimination rule inside of a program? Chances are that you wouldn't need much of an input. Now, in this case, it's a bit deceptive. What's really going on here is that this only depended on x in one premise. Had there been other premises like a y or a z, we would actually see some inputs here, like the value y would be here. This type of logic didn't need anything other than the x, so it didn't need any inputs at all. But in general, elimination will avoid having the data type itself in one of its inputs. Where is it getting it from? It's its own data. It's encapsulated inside. So that's a good hint of when you have elimination rules. How do we actually do it in Java? Lots of choices here, but one of the easiest ones is to just store some internal data. 
we create an example of my A as an internal piece of data. Once we have that, we store and compute that value in here. That should be a lowercase a. So we assign the input lowercase a to my a and the input lowercase b to my b. Now the values have been stored inside of my program. And when I run it, I then return the values that I've stored. All of this should match our computation rule. If I had little a and little b, then I get a projection where a comma b becomes a. That's exactly what doing get a would do. And we'll see that in our demonstration. Okay, it's time to try this out ourselves. And all of these work right now, and I hope that they'll work into the future because they're somewhat stable programming languages. Here's the Java version. If you follow the link there, you can do this demonstration yourself. When you select that copy, you can copy this code into JDoodle and try this out yourself. Try changing some of the information. Once you've tried the Java version, try the Scala version. Uh, go to this website, copy this text in, and try to run it. Make sure to run this one as a worksheet. Notice that the commands are slightly different. We have colons for our types now, similar to what we have in our introduction elimination rules in the syntax of sequent calculus. We also have a slightly different way of assigning things. The introduction rule is hidden inside of one line. It's just a different syntax, but we see that we still have the word class to try to produce a brand new type of formation. The formation takes our pair, and our AB, and it takes individual pieces of data as its introduction rule, and it has two elimination rules. The commands new is still doing the same thing. It's calling our introduction rule and producing the data we want, and then we get out the values five and five. Notice that five here is a string, and five here is an integer. They're very different types. The computer knows this, and it won't allow you to swap the order. If you want to get really crazy, try the Haskell version. This is a completely different type of programming language, but it also has the same basic ideas. We'll notice that now the command has changed from class to data, and we still use pair, and instead of parentheses, we just use spaces to separate our parameters. It's also the convention of this language to not use capital letters for the types, so we have little a and little b. That can be confusing given that all our slides have been with little a being the data, but I've changed this to x and y to remind us. And the final thing here is that this syntax uses the double colon instead of a single colon for the type. I don't care whether you know any of these three languages. I just want you to play around with matching the different ways that we would read any arbitrary programming language. We would look for where are the introductions, where are the elimination rules, where are the computational rules, where are the formation rules. And usually, once you know those four parts, you can start to read some brand new programming language in a few days, effectively understanding the nature of the logic. And it'll also help you select a programming language that matches how you think of the logic. Sequent calculus is a great translation. It's a universal language between mathematics and programming. Use it to your advantage. So here's the summary. Logic into types follows two basic steps. Your introductions become two rules. One is formation, one is the constructors or introduction rules. This is the things that will be called news and makes. The elimination rule, however, is more like the getters. First, you make sure the types are right, and then you add the computational rule for how you're going to move the data around. That's where all your creativity is, is how you actually choose to make that rule work. All you have to do is satisfy those four rules, formation, introduction, elimination, and computation, and you've turned all your logic into a type. Now that you know this, there must be a type for OR, and there's going to be a type for IMPLIES. And what about some other logical operators like INDUCTION or other things that you may not have heard of yet? All of those will have data types that go with them, and the more logic you learn, the more data types you get to make, and the crazier this stuff gets. But it's also quite fun to realize there's one meta principle behind it all. Take your logical operator, write it down in sequent calculus, turns introductions into formation and constructors, turns the eliminations into getters and computation rules. That's the foundation of just about every programming language. Until next time.